Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Engage Customer and KPMG Numwood webinar on Global Customer Experience Best Practice in Financial Services. My name is Chris Wood, Managing Director of Engage Customer, and I'm joined today by Vicky Joshi, Experience Design Director at KPMG Numwood. Uh, good morning, Vicky. Morning, Chris. In the UK financial services industry, uh, in the UK, the financial services industry is still struggling to win back customer trust as scandal after scandal haunts the sector. And um, at our customer engagement in financial services director last week, we identified that culture as the key to winning back customer trust from an increasingly sceptical and savvy customers. We will hear today how organisations in this sector across the globe are making considerable progress in transforming relationships and in some cases are way ahead of what's being achieved in the UK. We need to learn from these insights and best practices, particularly as 90% of global firms will be competing on customer experience rather than product or price within five years, according to Gartner. Before I hand over to Vicky, please feel free to ask questions at any time by clicking the blue button on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we will do uh, our best to answer as many questions as we can online, and those that we can't answer, uh, on, uh, answer online will actually answer later on offline. Vicky, uh, over to you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chris. So, uh, morning, everybody. Um, so, to kick off, um, so what we're going to cover today, I guess um, when Nunwood we focused about five years ago um, on customer experience, we really wanted to understand the answer to four critical questions. The first one being, what does excellence look like um, in customer experience across the globe? Which of those organizations are actually achieving excellence? And what is it that they're doing in particular that, that uh, allows them to succeed in customer experience? And finally, how can we help our clients and other organizations apply best practice to what they're doing with their customers? For us to be effectively successful and to support our clients on their customer experience journey, it was very important that we were able to identify what best in class look like and apply those best in class principles. So over the course of the last five years, the Experience Excellence Centre has uh, become quite a vast, if you like, and an in-depth resource. Effectively, we have covered three continents. We've covered over 850 different brands across those continents, and we've uh, gathered more than one million customer evaluations um, about specific interactions with each of those brands. So it's an incredibly vast resource which allows us to really deep dive into some of those best-in-class examples. So the agenda for today's session, um, I guess, breaks down to three main parts. Um, and what we're looking to do today is really understand what kind of global best practice looks like in financial services specifically. So the first part of the agenda, I'm going to talk to you guys about some case studies um, of what we refer to as, if you like, the customer experience pioneers. So these are organizations across the world which are tackling very uh, similar problems to a lot of the financial services organizations here in the UK, but are doing so in some very kind of new and innovative ways. So we'll look at exactly how they're doing that. Secondly, we're going to look at the six pillars of excellence. The six pillars are effectively the lens through which we understand and measure the customer experience. Fantastic organisations manage to get all six of these pillars right, but they might do something particularly outstanding in one or two. So as we move through the presentation, we'll start to pull out which of those organisations are really standing out for particular pillars. And then finally, as Chris has already alluded to, there's much talk about creating that customer-centric culture, which is very much vital to the implementation of a successful customer experience strategy and the implementation of the six pillars. We're going to see how each of these pioneers has taken major steps to creating a customer-centric culture. We're also going to look back, uh, back here in the UK and start to look at an organisation within the financial services sector that's doing great things here as well. So we're going to look a little bit in more detail at Nationwide Building Society. So to kick off, let's have a little look at the, uh, what we would call our pioneers from a global perspective. So we've identified six best-in-class organisations from around the world that are doing great stuff in customer experience at the moment. So the first of those organisations is Umqua Bank. 
So for those of you that don't know anything about Umqua, Umqua is um, a bank that's probably a reasonable, you know, it's a reasonable size. It's got about 700 branches, um, and it's based in, the, based in the northwest of the U.S. Now, Umqua is a, a particularly interesting brand. They are um, very confident, shall we say, and they, they answer the phone, Umqua, the world's greatest bank. Now, that for me takes a certain amount of confidence, especially in the current financial services climate. Um, and it's all about how they can make sure that their employees deliver that promise day in, day out. Their staff are trained by Ritz Carlton, so they very much recognise that actually best in class doesn't necessarily need to come from within the financial services sector, so they look to hospitality and other sectors to help them train their staff to deliver the best in class customer experience. And what we'll see in a little bit more detail later is they have a very unique approach to how they build relationships with customers um, and become an integral part of their local community. So we'll talk about that in further detail shortly. The second of our customer experience pioneers is Edward Jones. So Edward Jones is an um, investment bank over in the US. I actually recently uh, got ranked sixth um, in our most, use, uh, most recent US customer experience excellence survey. Now, the best way I can describe Edward Jones would be, if you like, a, a super large firm of financial services advisors. Um, they've got about 7 million customers, but they still strive to pro provide that sort of face-to-face -face advice and are very much all about being part of the local community in a very similar, similar vein to what Umqua are actually doing. Now, at Edward Jones, they talk about caring for their customers. It's very much central to the way that they approach customer experience. It's all about doing the right thing for their customers, showing their customers that they care, and they do this um, day in, day out, and encourage staff to share examples of when they've done something that's particularly caring um, and learn from each other and their own internal best practice examples. Now, caring is actually so well embedded within their organisation that CARES is an acronym that they use internally. So they talk about CARES, which comes down to clients come first always, associates working in partnerships with clients to achieve mutually beneficial relationships based on excellence and outstanding service. Now, they're very much focused on becoming integral parts of the community. And to a certain extent, when we get feedback from customers, some customers even talk about them being an extension and part of the family. You know, we get some great, um, we've got some great feedback from customers talking about, you know, their, their representative from Edward Jones sending them Christmas cards, birthday cards. Um, in fact, we even had one lady talking about the fact that she uh, received a Valentine's Day card from her representative at, uh, at Edward Jones, which she was particularly pleased with as she felt it kept her husband on his toes. Um, moving on to our third brand, CUA. So CUA is the credit union of Australia. So in UK terms, we would refer to CUA as a mutual, um, but they found a slightly unique and quite compelling way of talking about that, and they talk about that um, as being customer-owned. So they, they talk about themselves as being owned by their customers. Now, they look to return their profits to their customers by effectively committing to a pricing strategy which pays more, if you like, on savings accounts and undercuts the competition um, on um, interest rates, if you like, loans uh, and mortgages, etc. Again, as we've seen with Umqua and Edward Jones, there's very much this kind of focus around the community, and their branches are actually built to reflect each of those local communities that they're in, so they're quite, uh, some of them are, are actually quite uh, extraordinary, they're quite rustic, some are very homely, depending on the area of, the, of Australia that, that they're actually in, so if you think of sort of exposed brick, brick walls, they have photo walls of, of their customers and their families and their dogs and their pets. It's very much about becoming a central hub of the local community. Now, I think if we then, trans, uh, if we, if we then think about what that looks like over here at the moment, where a lot of our financial services banks and building societies are actually moving down the, um, the route of creating branches which are more digitally focused and probably less homely, there's probably quite a large contrast and there's some things that we could consider and learn from there. The fourth one that we're going to consider and look at today is USAA. So USAA are what we might term um, an infinity insurer and bank that's primarily focused on selling products and, and services to the US military and their families. Now, our global survey puts USAA firmly at the top as the most customer-centric organization. 
Now, everything that that organisation does is built around empathy. It's about understanding their customers. It's about delivering against those specific customer needs. So they've got a very deep and profound level of um, understanding of, of exactly what their customers are going through and how they can support them and help them. And we'll talk a little bit more um, in a little bit more detail later about exactly how USAA are, are doing that. Um, Ally Bank. Ally Bank for me is a particularly interesting organisation. So they're a digital bank that's effectively risen out of the financial crisis and they're promoting a new way of banking over in the US based on integrity and trust. So they are effectively trying to single-mindedly uh, reset the US consumers' um, expectations about what banking means. So we've got some really interesting, we've got a really interesting case study and example later which shows you how they're starting to talk to their customers about doing that and how they're backing that up internally with their behaviours and the way that they're effectively going about delivering that customer experience. And our final pioneer that we're, we're going to touch on today is Kiwi Bank. Now, Kiwi Bank were actually set up by the New Zealand Post Office in a, a bid to try and stop the pro progress being made by some of the Australian banks over in New Zealand. Um, ironically, they've been so successful that they've now moved into the Australian market. So, uh, um, you know, they're, they're doing great things. But actually what makes them very interesting is that they organise themselves very differently to how we see financial services um, organisations over here in the UK. They effectively have cross-functional customer teams, uh, which allows them to think about problems specifically from a customer's perspective and come up with the right solution, whether that's a digital solution, whether that's you know, um, a telephony solution, whatever that might be. So it's, uh, it's a particularly interesting example, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. They're also open seven days a week, nine till nine. And they really do recognise that, you know, digital as well as the more traditional um, sort of branch and telephony channels have got a key role to play in the end-to-end -end customer experience. So six really fantastic brands there across the, across the US and Australia and New Zealand. Now, um, coming back to, to Chris's point earlier, now one thing that these each of these brands has in common is that they have a fundamental and intense focus on culture. Um, Ray Davis of Umqua has written a couple of uh, highly successful business books on the subject and that's his quote there on the side. You can have a great culture without a great strategy, but you cannot have a great strategy without a great culture. So as we move through today's presentation, we'll start to identify some of those characteristics, some of those things that these organisations are doing to create that fantastic culture which is allowing them to deliver the best in class customer experiences. Now, across the board, when we, when we look um, across industries, not just financial services, we've started to see there's four, if you like, themes that are uniting customer experience leaders. Now, the first one of those um, is very much about the kind of, very much the focus on service, the focus on customer service is very, very clear. Now, as Chris mentioned earlier, Gartner recently uh, produced a forecast that by 2020, 90% of the world's organisations would be competing on customer experience rather than product and price. And actually, they went as far as saying that 50% of product development spend will actually be redirected towards co developing a competitively superior customer experience. And the organisations that we've just touched upon, those organisations that are actually delivering best-in-class experiences, live and breathe customer service day in, day out. The second of our themes is that it really must, it, to become great at customer experience, the agenda has to be set from the top. It has to be led by the CEO. And this is particularly true of many of our pioneers. So if we take sort of uh, Robert McDermott of, uh, of USAA, again, Ray Davis of Umqua, Edward Jones when he was setting up his business, it was very much driven by the top. The mandate at the top was to deliver the best possible customer experience. And for these CEOs, this means more than just talking and telling the organisation that customer experience is important. It means getting their hands dirty. It means getting to know their customers on a personal level. So it's very important that as we move forward and as each of those different organisations, as different organisations start to think about how they can compete on customer experience, that absolutely everybody from the top down is invested in understanding exactly what your customers need and how you can best deliver that. The third of our themes is actually customer-driven innovation. 
So again, our pioneers are fantastically good at talking to their customers day in, day out. They react to customer problems. So rather than being um, innovation from an internal point of view, or from an inside out point of view, it's very much letting the customers tell them what their problems are, what they need to, what they're trying to achieve, and the organization's coming up with better ways of delivering against those requirements. Uh, USAA is a great example of an organization that speaks to customers day in, day out, and they, they refer to it as customer surround sound, and that really does develop and, and challenge the way that the business delivers the experience. And our final, um, if you, our final thing to, to touch upon today is actually how these organizations have embedded digital within their ex existing structures rather than effectively having it as something separate within their organizations. So for our pioneers, the role of if you like, chief digital officer was very much short-lived for these companies. They effectively see digital as just another way of doing business with their customers. It's, a, it's an extension of how they already work. So rather than having a digital team or a digital part of the business, they, everybody is together. There's no separate budgets. There's no separate um, sort of um, list of, of initiatives. It's, it's organized around the customer rather than by, by channel. So digital very much still plays an important part, but it's more of an integrated part than we potentially see here in the UK. So I guess in short, if we're going to summarize what, what we've talked about so far, our pioneers operate to a slightly different model to some of the other organizations that we work with. Um, they very much start with the customer mindset. So they start from the outside in, from the customer perspective, rather than the inside out. Now, not for one second are we suggesting that we don't need both operational excellence and customer intimacy. Actually, it's your point of departure, it's where you start from that governs how successful, successful you're going to be in delivering a fantastic customer experience. Now, uh, at KPMG and Wood, we're privileged to work with a number of different and fantastic organizations, but a key insight for us has been about how different organizations define moments of truth here in the UK. Now, typically, what we find is organizations define moments of truth as being very much product-based. So we, we might refer to opening an account, for example, or uh, transferring money uh, or making a query. Now, for not, uh, we're not saying for one second that those aren't important things, but they're probably not fundamental moments of truth from a customer perspective. When we contrast this with how USAA talk about their moments of truth, they refer to every catastrophe, every recovery, every loss, every triumph, Every deployment, every homecoming, every injury, illness, or bereavement, a widow surviving on a budget, family separated by thousands of miles, these are our moments of truth. Now, quite, quite different to, I guess, the way that many of the organizations we work with in the UK are currently defining moments of truth. So it's, it's very much something for us to think about. But again, USAA are looking at that from the outside in rather than the inside out. And they're doing a great job of balancing those two perspectives, making sure they've got operational excellence, but it's all through the lens of customer intimacy. So what makes an experience excellent? Now, for those of you that are familiar with num uh, number six pillars of customer experience excellence, I'm just going to touch on these very, very briefly, and we'll talk about exactly how organizations live, breathe, and deliver these in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but we've got the six pillars. So the first being personalization. So personalization is using individualized attention to effectively uh, drive an emotional connection with customers. So how can we deliver a personalized experience that's going to make that customer feel mo more emotionally attached to, to that brand? Time and effort. Uh, so what can we do to minimize customer effort and create frictionless processes so that it's as easy as it possibly can be for customers that are dealing with us? Resolution. So resolution is a, is a particularly interesting one. So how do we turn a poor experience into a great one? Now we know from our work that actually when you get this right, when you do something fantastic, um, it actually often leaves that customer feeling better about your organization and about your brand than they would have done had nothing gone wrong in the first place. So it's a real opportunity to delight and build strong customer relationships. Expectations. So how do we not only set, but manage, meet, and where possible uh, and where probable exceed those customer expectations? What does that look like and how do we do that? Now integrity, now integrity and trust are effectively both sides of the same coin. 
Um, how can we demonstrate we're a brand with integrity and how can we drive customers to trust us more? And finally, the final pillar is empathy. So how can we achieve a great understanding, a deep understanding of our customer circumstances, reflect that back in the experience that we deliver to them? Now, our regression analysis shows when we start to look at the impact that each of these six pillars has on um, advocacy and loyalty, it explains about 66%. So um, it's, you know, the a vast majority, so two-thirds of, of what's driving those measures can be explained by these six pillars. When we look to add things like value, product, price, what we typically find is it only adds another sort of three to four percent. So with the um, remaining sort of 30% uh, being things that tend to be outside an organization's control. So going back to, to Chris's point earlier in the Gartner quote, actually, you know, by 2020, 90% of organizations will be competing on customer experience rather than product or price. Looking at our analysis, I would almost say that this is already happening now. We're already competing on customer experience, um, whether we realize it or not. So we're now going to talk in a little bit more detail about specific examples of brands that are doing great things across those six pillars. Now personalization, so the first example we're going to talk about is Umqua. So Umqua, as I've already talked about, um, as you can see from that top uh, right hand picture, are not exactly shy and retiring. You know, they're quite happy to, to shout about um, and their claim that they're the world's greatest bank. It's very clearly stated in their branches. Um, but Effectively, they, they want that claim to be out there and they want to make sure that each and every one of their staff um, delivers against that expectation day in, day out. Um, they use their branches to reflectively, uh, their, sorry, their branches or, or what they refer to as their stores, um, are designed and feel a little bit more like a, what I would class as a hotel lobby or maybe an upmarket coffee shop. Um, and because of that, they, they also practice what they refer to as slow banking. So they allow customers to just come in and spend time in branch just to hang out, have a coffee, spend a bit of time in the, on the internet, um, and they're trying to create a community where you just sort of drop in. So popping into Umqua is just like popping into Starbucks. It's just like popping into, you know, popping into your local pub. They just they want you to come in to browse, and then you'll always be top of mind when you're considering them again in the future. Now they very much see their stores as community assets. So between the hours of sort of five and seven in the evening, you can book meeting rooms for community meetings. Uh, they hold community events there. They're very much focused on making a real contribution to their local community, however that might um, be most appropriate. They're also very, very good at, if you like, educating. Um, so they often set up their branches in a classroom, classroom style and have um, people coming in to do seminars on setting up a business, buying your first home, how to manage your finances better. They were mentoring sessions uh, with experienced professionals and that can provide help and, and support to others. And uh, once a month, anybody that's new to the uh, location and that's just moved in to the area um, gets invited along just for a sort of welcome to the welcome to the area, you know, glass of bubbles, meet other people. So it's very much the heart of the community. And so much so that they even uh, quite randomly have a uh, fleet of ice cream vans that they uh, that where they go out to local events and uh, give out free ice creams to their to their local community and their customers. So it's, very, it's very interesting, Vicky. That, uh, sorry to interrupt there, but uh, that, 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 that uh, you've actually got uh, an, an organisation that's doing really well um, uh, that uh, in, in this troubled sector um, that, that, that's. Uh, really being part of the local community mm -hmm. uh, and you would have thought that a lot of the examples of uh, guys really sort of um, um, uh, blazing uh, the trail um, uh, and setting new standards would, would be doing perhaps more and more stuff online but it's interesting you've got the community sort of aspect to this as well. Yes, definitely. And I think the, the nice thing that Umqua are doing and many of the other pioneers that we're talking about today is that they've got that balance right. So the community focus is about drawing people into their branches. It's about be, becoming, you know, that community hub. They've also then got all of the digital assets and the, and the um, if you like, exactly what we've got here in the UK. So people can still do things very quickly, uh, very time efficiently. Um, but they've just got that nice balance of that kind of personalized community feel along with is the digital assets to support it. Yeah, it's a good combination, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It certainly works for them. 
And I think, you know, the, the other thing that they're fantastic at doing is not only personalising to their local community, but they're also fantastic at translating that into individual customer interactions. So how do they, you know, interact with each of those individuals? They make sure that they're always listening. They react to those personal needs. And they, they build very, very strong uh, relationships with their customers, uh, both through the kind of community aspect and that kind of individual personalisation. So a, a great example of, uh, of a brand doing great things there. So moving on to the expectations pillar. So Kiwi Bank, um, as we touched upon very briefly earlier, are actually on a, a mission to, to fight what they call soulless banking. So as I mentioned uh, a little earlier, they're actually open nine till nine and they're attached to the local post office. So for many people, because they're open nine till nine, they often choose to interact with them in the evenings. Again, it's got that kind of community feel. It's quite a nice interaction. They enjoy going. Now, Kiwi Bank are doing something quite different. So at head office, they organise themselves in a very different way. They're structured around the customer. So their head office teams are actually structured around customer journeys or life events rather than by product or channel. So they have completely cross-functional teams uh, that are responsible for the end-to-end -end customer process or journey, if you like, and, and are looking for opportunities to wow regardless of how they do that. So they work together, whether they're digital, whether they're telephony, whether it's product, whether it's um, you know, pricing, to make sure that that end-to-end -end customer experience is as good as it possibly can be. So they're not only setting and managing good expectations for customers as well, but they're also delivering um, that kind of wow and, uh, and exceeding expectations where appropriate. Now, because of the way that they work, this is translated into some fantastic apps. So, um, in particular, one of the apps that I like is their um, Home Finder app, which uh, not only uses augmented reality, but also has um, sort of an ROI calculator. So, yeah, I think you can walk down the road, take a picture of a property you, you like the look of. It gives you all the information, the details about how much that property could cost you. Um, and if you, you can go then in and say that actually if you were to upgrade the bathroom or upgrade the kitchen, um, would that be a good return on investment? So they're very, you know, a lot of the um, applications and the ways that they deliver this kind of wow and, and exceed expectations is going beyond what you might class as their sort of day-to-day -day role in people's lives. They're trying to help them with the holistic end-to-end -end customer journey rather than just the bit that they can control and that they've got, some, uh, got a key part of. Um, the other great thing about Kiwi Bank is they've also got a fantastic um, set of online relationship managers uh, with a promise to answer any question, absolutely anything, ranging from the simple to the obscure, uh, within 24 hours. And that's a promise they keep. And nine times out of ten, they are obviously coming back to their customers far quicker than that. But again, those could be questions that are relating directly to a financial services product, but they could also be something that's um, sort of more general and they've got a promise that they'll make sure that they get back to their customers to support them with those queries. And it's, it's the Kiwi Bank. Who actually owns that, um, Vicky? You, you said that earlier that, that that actually come out of the post office. Who actually owns that now? Is that... Uh... So, um, so Kiwi Bank, well, that's a very good question. I believe that they are still owned by the post office in part, so there's still right. very much a, a close uh, relationship with the, with the uh, New Zealand post office. I think what they've started to do uh, very recently um, is, although they've got that very close relationship with the post office, they've, take, they've taken, if you like, a little bit of a, a step back, and they're actually a, a sort of a, an own subsidiary of the New Zealand post office, but they have very much created their own identity, especially with moving into the Australian market. So they've had to be able to sort of stand on their own two feet. So as I say, they, they are connected with the post office, which works really well from a kind of locality point of view uh, within New Zealand. But they've sort of, if you like, sort of very much had to stand on their own two feet and create, create their own identity when they've gone into to the Australian market. Well, that's good to see uh, that, that sort of innovation with that app that you mentioned uh, from an organisation that's still sort of uh, are partly involved with, uh, with, with bits of the government. I mean, that's encouraging to see that. It, yes, yeah, it is. It's fantastic. And they, they are doing some great things. And, and I think that's why they're, so, they're a great example of an organisation that's going beyond delivering against people's expectations, because you might not necessarily expect an organisation, like you say, that's affiliated or, or owned by, by the post office to do some of the fantastic digital things that, that, that these guys are doing at the moment. Yeah. Great. Now, valuing time or time and effort, um, we're going to talk a little bit about USAA here. Now, 
Uh, USAA were actually the first bank in the US to allow customers to take a photo of a check and have it processed. So a, a really great way of uh, responding to you know, like the needs of their customers. So if you're, I'm a, a soldier that's stationed thousands of miles away from home and I want to get a check processed, I can literally just take a photo and that goes straight through. Um, they've also got a fantastic app um, when anybody who's insured with them for their car insurance has, a, has an accident. So effectively, if you have an accident, you can uh, take a picture of the, of the damage that's actually taken place. You can um, speak to the app and record exactly what happened at that moment in time. And it even uses GPS coordinates to record the um, weather conditions at that particular point. So if it was particularly icy, if there was something that caused the, the crash that was beyond your control. Um, and you can effectively tell the organisation that you've had an accident within seconds, within minutes of actually having that accident. And what they're then able to do is, is come back to you as quickly as possible and promise you you'll get a replacement vehicle if you need one within the next hour. So they're very, they are very, very good at recognising that their customers are time poor, that they need to get on with their day and they will do everything they possibly can to make sure that that already very stressful process can be dealt with uh, very efficiently and um, in the best possible manner for their customers. So that's just a couple of great examples of things that um, USAA are doing. Now they're also particularly focused on how they can harness sort of big data and huge databases of transactional uh, information so better equip their customers with information. So a great example of that would be um, they have got, if you like, um, if you're going out to buy a new car, for example, they've got uh, um, applications and ways of sharing information about other USA customers that have been to particular dealerships and how much money they managed to get off and how much they could negotiate down. So if you're going to buy, I don't know, uh, your, your new family car, you can see other USAA customers managed to get 15% off that price at this particular dealership and it gives you that benchmark and it gives you something to strive for. But at the same time, if you then decide that you want to purchase that car, um, they're also able to organise your finance and your insurance very, very quickly for you. So they go from being the um, organisation that can just do each of those products for you individually to being the organisation that, that not only helps you get the best possible deal for that car, but is also able to make sure that you get the best possible deal for your insurance and your um, finance um, if you decide to go through the purchase. So they're doing some really great stuff um, from a, a digital point of view. And I think what's really interesting for me with USAA is actually they don't just measure those sort of classic customer experience measures like NPS and customer satisfaction. USAA are looking at measuring the impact that they've actually had on their customers' lives. They really want to understand the, if you like, the return on time invested for the customer. So if we're asking customers to allocate some of their scarce resource of time to doing things with USAA, what type of benefit does the customer get from that? Whether that's something tangible, whether that's something financial, or whether that's something emotional. So USAA are actually flipping the way that they start to measure you know, customer impact. It's more about how the impact they can have on their customers lives rather than how likely they would be to recommend or their kind of overall satisfaction with an individual interaction. Uh, interesting uh, approach there, Vicky. Um, uh, can I just interject um, uh, before you move on to the next case study? Um, uh, we've had a couple of questions in regarding um, uh, two of the case studies uh, you've, uh, you've already mentioned. Uh, we've actually got uh, uh, a question in from, um, uh, from uh, uh, Chloe at um, uh, uh, Sainsbury's Bank. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you give an example of how uh, 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 Kiwi uh, um, uh, structure uh, actually works, how they define um, uh, the, uh, the customer? So, yes, yeah, so the Kiwi structure effectively, they look at it from a customer journey point of view. So if, you, if we think about you've got an, an overall customer life cycle, if you like, so there's, there's a series of events throughout a customer's relationship with the brand that they could, um, they could go through. They break that down by customer journey. So if that is uh, mortgages, for example, they have a mortgage team that looks across the end-to-end -end customer journey. So they have that including people from product pricing, for example, propositions. But they also have somebody there from um, marketing. They have somebody that represents each of those channels 
So they effectively work together to deliver the best possible experience at each and every one of those different stages across the end-to-end -end customer journey. So they take, they look at it from the customer point of view, so they look at it from the outside in first. It's the customers that drive the demand for innovation, drive the demand for change, and they work together as a collective to effectively deliver the right solutions to customers. So rather than the organizations that we have here in the UK, where typically you'll have a product team, you'll have um, you know, a, a team that, that look after your telephony channel, somebody else that looks after digital, they, although everybody has a dotted line into somebody that has overall sight for digital telephony, etc., they they work together in if you like customer journey teams. So it's a very different different way of being structured, but it's incredibly effective when it comes to you know uh, reacting to challenges set by customers. Okay, uh, uh, thanks very much for that. And uh, another question we've got here, here mm -hmm. from uh, Rodrigo. Uh, who owns the design and delivery of customer experience within the, uh, these organisations? So, who owns the design and delivery? Yeah. Right. Well, um, the design and the delivery. So, as, as I talked about earlier, the mandate to understand customer and to, to support customer comes from the top. So, it's very much driven by the CEO. The majority of these organizations then have a, a chief customer officer, so somebody that actually has the mandate to look at the customer experience day in, day out, um, and work with each of the other areas of the organization to make sure that customer is constantly on the agenda, regardless of the, of the type of meeting that they might be having. Is, you know, let's look at that through the customer, uh, customer lens. Are we delivering the right type of experience to our customers? How do we balance that with the internal challenges that we might be facing in terms of reducing cost to serve, for example? So um, for many of these organizations, they do have, if you like, a, a chief customer officer that, that, that effectively owns the end-to-end. The -end. Okay, okay. All right, thanks so much. Okay. Great. So moving on to um, our, our next pillar. So this one's particularly interesting. So as I talked about earlier, so integrity. So integrity, I guess, within financial services, um, as Chris talked about earlier, you know, there's still some way to go for people to really start to be uh, to feel like they completely trust their financial services providers again. Now, Ally Bank over in the US uh, are doing everything they can uh, to restore integrity in the banking sector and demonstrate this through some really clear advertising, which we'll look at very shortly. Now, to back this up, they're also providing their customers with all of those digital assets and these the apps that we've sort of talked about, we've looked at elsewhere. So for Ally, it's very much about we're on this side of our customers, um, but they are making sure that they've got the infrastructure, they've got the support, they've got the systems, and they're delivering across the other six, uh, the other of the of the pillars at the same time. Now, I think we're just going to uh, watch a short short video now. So just bear with me a minute. Would you like a pony? Yeah. Would you like a pony? Yeah. Here you go, this is for you. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Well, you didn't say you could have a real one. Well, you didn't ask. which you know really just speak volumes about the way that Ally is actually going about trying to restore integrity within the banking sector in the US. Now, um, this is just one of the many examples they've got. So there's some fantastic stuff. So you know, I would recommend for everybody to get on YouTube and to start to look at some of the other messages that the, that the Ally Bank guys are actually sharing with their with their consumers. This is a fantastic um, fantastic example of um, how they're talking to the US consumer, but they really need to back this up with the way that they act, the way they deliver the experience to their customers. Now, when you look at the um, sort of the Ally um, Values document, which is a, a, another fantastic document that you can get. Get, um, access to online. You know, they talk about the expectation that each and every one of their employees has to act with integrity. They have to take personal responsibility for maintaining the highest standards of honesty, tr trustworthiness, and ethical conduct. So each and every person that joins Ally Bank, it's not all about whether they've got the skills to be able to do the job right. It's also about whether they've got the uh, right attitude, whether they're going to be able to uphold Ally Bank's sort of integrity. So for me, Ally Bank's a really great example of an organisation that's doing fantastic things that we've talked about elsewhere with some of the other with some of the other um, so some of the other pioneers. 
But they're doing that um, at the same time as really starting to challenge consumers' perceptions of their financial services over there in the US. And um, empathy. Now, I, I know we've already talked a little bit about USAA, but we really couldn't talk about empathy without talking about USAA. Now, it spans absolutely everything this organisation does. So, very much from when you're um, actually about to start your employment with them, uh, you receive your mobilisation orders rather than a, a, a welcome letter. Um, and the first thing it actually tells you to do is get your affairs in order, uh, exactly in the same way as it would do if you were in the military. So, you start to feel and understand exactly what it might be like to be in the shoes of your customers. Uh, new employees are also taken through weeks of military training. We've got a, a nice picture there of somebody that's walking around in her uh, military uniform, and that, I think uh, they're, they're also expected to eat military rations as well, so they can really start to empathise and understand exactly what it feels like for, to be one of their customers uh, stationed abroad. Um, now, many of their employees actually are ex-military, which I guess makes empathising with the, the situation they're in that little bit easier. But even for those employees that aren't, they spend a huge amount of time letting them um, speak to instructors, customers coming in all the time, talking about their individual experiences. So that customer might be somebody that is stationed abroad that is in the military, but it could also be their wife or their partner that's been, you know, that's left at home. They come in, they talk to people about what it's like to live uh, as part of a military family in the US. What are the challenges they face? What do they need to do? What, do they, uh, what could organisations help them with? Um, and it really does allow them to start to understand and develop a deep and uh, deep sort of level of understanding of their customers and their needs and build a really deep rapport. So when you look um, at some of the kind of customer verbatim comments and the things that people are posting on forums about USA, it's just customers talking about the fact they just get it. They understand what it's like to be me. They're doing everything they can to move heaven and earth to make sure that I get the resolution that I need, and they do it in the right way. So USAA is a fantastic example of an, uh, an organisation that really does build deep relationships through understanding their customers. And our final uh, pillar um, would be resolution. Now, I think this one's a particularly interesting one. Um, and, you know, we, we all know as customers ourselves that things don't go right all the time, and actually we're okay with that. But it's how an organisation actually deals with something when it goes wrong that we sort of, uh, we remember and has a big impact on how we feel about that organisation in the future. So for any organisation, effectively, they've got to have a plan B. But actually, um, this is a particularly interesting and uh, extreme plan B that UMQA have got. So as you can see from this picture, every single branch has what they call the gold phone, or um, I think internally it can often be referred to as the bat phone. Um, now, the very first entry on the call directory is dial 8 to speak to the CEO. And we actually mean you get through to him. They don't mean his PA or his office, and actually, if he's not around, then you get through to his mobile. Now, you have to have a pretty, uh, you know, good level of confidence that you've got a great organisation to be able to do something like this. Um, it very much is the ultimate testament um, to the CEO's belief in his, in his business, but also that, also that sort of show of commitment to the customers. So if um, a particular issue gets to a point where you know, nobody else has been able to resolve it and a customer feels the need to speak to the person that's in charge of the entire organisation, the CEO sees that as, that, that's my job. I'm there, I'm their final point of contact. I'm the person that needs to get this resolved for them. So a very extreme example of resolution, but a fantastic example of how an organisation is committed to making sure each and every one of those customer interactions, when they don't always go right, and um, you know, get gets the right sort of resolution that they need. And finally, um, just a few words on um, a, an organisation here in the UK, and we're just going to talk a little bit more about kind of emerging trends, uh, very much focused around customer centricity and culture. So um, nationwide, uh, Building Society are a fantastic example of an organisation which is focused on its culture and seeing some fantastic results. So uh, nationwide, um, in 2014, actually moved into eighth position in our customer experience excellence rankings, um, and they've seen some fantastic pillar performance. So you can see on just on the right hand side of that slide, their pillar performance, um, you know, is anything between sort of seven and nine percent above the um, financial services industry average. So they're doing some really great stuff. 
Now, um, for Nationwide, there's effectively four strands to the way in which they've gone about creating uh, the right type of culture to deliver the best possible customer experience. The first of those is um, they've set a very clear goal for the entire organisation to create clear blue water for customer satisfaction between them and their high street competitors. And in order to be able to do that, they've got to allow everybody from the guys on the front line right up to head office to have direct access to customer feedback. Everybody needs to understand what they can do as an individual to better deliver um, the optimum experience to customers. So they have they utilize things like real-time verbatim feedback. Um, they are very visible on how each of those different branches or different areas of the business is actually doing when it comes to customer experience. And they share best practice across the organization. So, you know, if there's something great being done over here, what can we do to implement that and, and do, do that consistently elsewhere in the organization? Their commitment also um, allowed them to, you know, when they start to talk to the business and, and when their CEO starts to talk to the business about we're going to, you know, we're going to be number one for customer experience, then that commitment also came with a promise that actually if they achieve that, each and every person in the organization would receive um, a, substantial, a substantial bonus. So, you know, everybody was brought into this, everybody was committed, everybody had a role to play and everybody, you know, worked together to achieve that. The second, if you like, strand is they identified what sort of made the model branch, if you like. So they started to look at the behaviours of the top performing branches and decoded those so they could start to think about how they would roll out those behaviours elsewhere. Um, so effectively, once they were able to identify, you know, the, the top branch or top um, X amount of branches, they started to understand, okay, well, these are the different behaviours, these are the things that they're doing slightly differently to everybody else that means that they're delivering that slightly better, more exceptional experience to our customers. How can we effectively take those learnings and roll those out? So whether that's, you know, initiatives in training, whether that's changes to the way that we process things, um, they, they very much focused on taking, if you like, and creating a blueprint of the of, uh, branch excellence and, and roll that out, out elsewhere to really push customer experience across the board to the next level. The third thing is very much around this kind of cultural shift. So, you know, they understand that it's not just about that end focus on the customers, it's also about that focus on their employees. So Nationwide have got Pride, which is effectively their kind of uh, behavioural framework, and it's very much embedded in, in, uh, across the entire organisation. They also have peer-to-peer -peer award nominations, which allows absolutely anybody, regardless of, uh, regardless of role or rank, across the organisation the opportunity to be recognised and rewarded for doing great things for customers. They also realise that you've got to have a set of um, really engaged and, and, and employees that feel like they're enabled to do their job really well, and that's paramount to being able to deliver the best possible customer experience. So they look at these two things alongside each other, um, and, and they're very much integrated. You can't have a great employee experience without a great customer experience, and you can't have a great customer experience without a great employee experience. And the final strand, if you like, and obviously we touched upon this earlier as one of our key themes, is technology and process. Now, they play a key role for Nationwide. You know, they haven't forget, forgotten about operational excellence. Um, they're very heavily investing in digital technology and creating processes and systems that deliver against customer needs and strip out any of those unnecessary processes um, that, that typically we can, within the financial services uh, sector, we can sometimes uh, cause customers to go through. So Nationwide are very much looking at this from the customer perspective, so they're looking at it from the outside in. They're looking at it from the inside out and they're making sure that their um, employees are happy, they're engaged, that they're able to deliver the best possible experience and they're providing them the right technology, the right um, processes, the right systems to deliver that best-in-class experiences to their customers. And, you know, they've seen fantastic, uh, fantastic results. So eight in, our, eight in our survey last year, and they've, uh, they've certainly been doing some fantastic things, and their customers are, are really, really proud to be part of, part of Nationwide Building Society. I'm, I'm not surprised, Vicky, and uh, these are guys that actually get uh, uh, the relationship between uh, employee engagement and customer engagement. You can't have one without the other. So uh, uh, it's uh, not, not surprising to see them uh, high up in the rankings and, uh, and doing so well. I know that it's appropriate now to perhaps uh, put in a, a question from someone from, uh, yeah. from Nationwide. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Matthew at uh, 
uh, and, and nationwide. And uh, he's saying, uh, what uh, methods do these banks use to spread the message of, of an important customer service uh, uh, to their branch employees? To their branch employees. So they've got a variety of different methods. So um, for some of them, they have got um, they, they use, I guess, the more traditional methods. So as with most banks and, and building societies here in the UK, uh, they all start with the, the kind of daily huddle. So get the teams together in the branches. Everybody shares the latest uh, information. What do they need to know um, before they start the day? So for many, that, that communication goes through the branch manager and is shared out uh, with each of those individual employees at that session. Uh, they also utilise technology, so um, gaining uh, direct um, feedback, uh, customer feedback through technology uh, at each of those individual branches, but also um, newsletters and, 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 e and email. So I guess that's on a day-to-day -day basis. For um, a couple of examples, so um, I know that USAA um, and um, I think it is Umqua um, also have sort of internal social media. So as and when something's just happened and they're, they're about to do something or they're about to make a change or you know there's a particular customer need that's been identified, that's posted on their social media networks internally so that everybody knows that something's a, you know there's, there's about to be a change or we're about to do something slightly different. So they've all got slightly different ways of working. Um, some of them, like I say, are the sort of more traditional you know daily hood. Uh, whereas, whereas others um, are, are more about sort of newsletters, digital technology, and um, social social media. Okay, thanks again. Um, okay, well, I'm very close to the end now, so I guess um, all that remains for me to say is that the excellent centre resources um, are online uh, for anybody that wants to register. We've got a huge amount of case studies, uh, access to data, additional information about some of the brands that I've talked about here today, and also some brands in, in other sectors. So again, you know, there's an opportunity to, to learn about best-in-class from, from elsewhere. So um, if there's any other questions, we could take them now. Yeah, absolutely, and, um, and uh, thank you very much, Vicky. And if people go onto your website, they'll also be able to download the, uh, uh, the research and the analysis that you actually do in these regions as well, won't they? They, they certainly will, yeah. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Well, we've got uh, a, a question here from uh, uh, Sadia at uh, Mars, uh, and um, it says, uh, our organisation measures satisfaction of our internal customers, so we provide a service for the business. Uh, but uh, we're one company. Can this be applied um, uh, elsewhere? So, sorry, just to just to yeah, read uh, that. The question is: um, oh, uh, Our organisation, Mars, uh, measures satisfaction of our internal customers. Yeah. So we provide a service um, for the business, but we are one company. Can this uh, uh, easily be applied? I would say so. Um, I think. <laughs> The way that each individual organisation is structured can, uh, can mean that you have to apply some of the learnings and some of the things that we've talked about today in a slightly different way. Um, I think that, for me, that's particularly interesting. So they measure the satisfaction of their internal customers. That's that actually is quite different to what we see with a lot of our other, you know, a lot of other organisations that don't even do that. So for me. Um, I think that's a particular that's a, that's a really good starting point. I think there's certainly some um, of the learnings and the things that we talked about here today that could could be applied um, to the Mars organisation. I think without knowing a, in a lot more detail exactly how they're structured and exactly how it, how it works, it's, it's very difficult to give a precise answer. But I think every organisation should be looking at both the outside in and the inside out. But I appreciate that the outside in might look very different for each of those different organisations. And the types of measures and the things that are most important to you might be slightly different. Now, the six pillars are a fantastic framework because regardless of organisation and regardless of what that overall measure is, every single experience, whether that's with your internal customers, external customers, you know, we need to make sure that we're personalising it. We need to make sure that we're taking into account how much effort and time people are having to put into it. So the six pillars is a particularly great way, or a framework, if you like, of, of, of analysing are we delivering the best experience to customers regardless of whether they're internal or external. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, we're running a, a slightly over, but uh, just one last question uh, from uh, Liz at uh, Old uh, Mutual Wealth. Uh, regarding uh, Umqua, uh, how do you pronounce it? Umqua? Umqua. Umqua. Not Umqua. 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 
uh, bank. Um, uh, does your approach actually work from a monetary perspective? Um, Lizette saying, uh, it sounds uh, good, however, I, found, I find them almost intrusive, um, uh, stroke uh, creepy. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yes, they certainly do make money. So the way that Umqua um, builds relationships with their customers is through that kind of customer closeness through the community. So, you know, whenever a, a customer is considering their next financial services product, they're so used to just popping into Umqua or having some, or, you know, spending time with Umqua that they're, they're constantly at the top of that consideration list. So from a kind of a monetary perspective, a profit perspective, a, a driving investment perspective, they do particularly well. Um, but it really is about how they grow that sort of depth of relationship. And it really, you, you're right, it's not necessarily for everybody. And for some people, that having that kind of physical presence and going in all the time isn't necessarily what they're after. But for the Umqua um, customers, it tends to be, you know, they're attracted to the brand because they have that more sort of classic um, face-to-face relationship in many cases. But it's also backed up, like I say, by the sort of digital technology. So for many customers, if they're not comfortable with that, sort of slightly more intrusive um, approach, um, then that's not a problem. You can still interact with Umqua through different channels in different ways, or obviously there's, there's other options out there. But they're certainly playing to um, a particular segment of the market that's keen to have that kind of community spirit, that kind of community feel, that's looking for an organisation that sort of feels like they're, they're on their side and they're doing their best for that, that local community. So it, it certainly works from, from a commercial perspective for them as well. I suppose there could be possibly uh, cultural differences as well, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Vicky. Well, um, um, I, I think that's all we've got time for now. Is there anything else that uh, you'd like to say, Vicky? As... Um, no, that, that's everything. But uh, just to touch on the end, all of those resources are available on our website. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Well, it just leaves uh, me to say uh, thank you all for, uh, for for joining us today, and thank you to uh, to our sponsor, uh, KPMG Numwood. Uh, and uh, um, we, we look forward to you joining us, uh, joining us next time to one of our webinars, directors forums, or our customer engagement summit that's coming up in uh, November. And you can find out more information about uh, uh, our Engage uh, customer at engagecustomer.com. And of course, we're covering the employee engagement market as well with engageemployee.com as well. So uh, thank you uh, for joining us, and uh, 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 look forward to you joining us again the next time.